Good evening and welcome to our second event in this summer semester's GCC keynote lecture series. My name is Jens Kugele, I'm Head of Research Coordination, a member of the Executive Board here at our Center GCSC. And I'm very much looking forward to our exchange today on questions of cultural literacy, modernization, urbanization, and transformation in Eastern European borderlands. As most of you know, our traditional keynote lecture series offers a prominent platform um, at our research center for established scholars from Germany and abroad. And this series, as in the previous semesters, provides an opportunity to get acquainted with interdisciplinary perspectives to the study of culture and to engage in a conversation with experts in their fields. We started this semester's conversation with Edward Ariaga's lecture event last week, who shared with us some key aspects of his research on data decolonization in Afro-Brazilian community data networks. And I'm thrilled that we have the chance tonight again to engage in a conversation with an international culture studies scholar in the context of our keynote lecture series our guest researcher, uh, Professor Cristina Florea. She is not only guest researcher this year, uh, but also this year's Cornell re representative at the GCSC in the context of the GCC exchange with Cornell University, specifically the Institute for German Culture Studies, IGCS, an exchange which we treasure very much. Thank you very much again, Cristina, for accepting our invitation and for joining us tonight. Allow me to add, as always, just a brief note on the format of tonight's event. Directly after the lecture, we invite questions and comments from all of you in the audience. And for those of you who are joining us online, during the Q&A, as always, if you would like to pose a question or make a comment, please enter a plus in the chat and we'll be happy to add you to the list. However, if you prefer, you may also just write your questions or comment directly in the chat and we'll be happy to read it out. Tonight's event will be recorded. The recording, however, is limited to the audio and video of our presenters. And the recording does not include the Q&A session afterwards, neither does it include any chat activity or any metadata regarding the participants of this session. It is my privilege to very briefly introduce to you our presenter. Christina Florea is an assistant professor in modern European history at Cornell University, researching and teaching the histories of Eastern and Central Europe and the Soviet Union in the 19th and 20th centuries. Her work focuses on borderlands, imperial entanglements and competition, and the interplay of nationalisms and empires in the region. She is currently completing a book entitled Crossroads of Empire, State and Culture in Europe's Eastern Borderlands, which traces the evolution of governance strategies and ideologies of rule in the region between Romania and Ukraine over the course of almost two centuries. Combining a local and a micro historical lens with a sensitivity to global context, this book highlights a great extent to which remote, seemingly, seemingly backward places of Europe's periphery have shaped the development of modern statehood and sovereignty. Christina Florea's interests also include mass emigration and displacement in Eurasia, challenges to democracy, the workings of authoritarianism, and the rise of extremist politics, both in the right and on the left, in interwar Europe. She's hoping to explore this latter theme in the second book project through the life story of the Austrian Jewish writer Josef Roth, who witnessed Europe's decay firsthand as he traveled the continent after the Habsburg Empire's collapse, moving from hotel to hotel throughout the 1920s and 30s. We're truly looking forward to learning more about her work. Please join me in welcoming Professor Christina Florea. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jens, and thank you everybody for coming here. And thank you to this lovely institute for inviting me. I'm really, really happy to be here. I'm finally having some good food after a long time in the US. <laughs> um, OK, so I w as I was thinking about how to begin today, I decided that maybe I would start with this one episode in the history of this place that I'm writing about. And that is World War I. Right, in 1914, and I'll start here. In August 1914, right, the beginning of World War I, uh, the inhabitants of this city that I write about, named Chernovitz or Chernivtsi right now, uh, were perched up 
on top of the city hall tower, as you see there. I mean, obviously not the whole population, a few of them were perched up on, this, uh, on the uh, city hall tower from where they could observe directly how Cossack troops were approaching the city and eventually entered it uh, as they made their way to the Prut River, which separated essentially the city from the countryside. These locals who were uh, on top of that tower could see the Russian troops coming near through opera glasses and binoculars. This is how close they were. It didn't take the Russian troops a long time to enter the city. News came in of raping, pillaging in the countryside, and the local Austrian administration had already fled, leaving most of the population defenseless. Many people were scared out of their wits especially some of the Jewish population that had already heard about the atrocities that Russian troops were committing against the Jews that they found in their path. Initially, there was a lot of looting and destruction. And here's uh, a picture also from the um, headquarters of one of the top newspapers uh, published in the city that got completely ravaged right, during this first uh, Russian invasion. Uh, Russian soldiers also uh, made their headquarters in the university building, they destroyed scientific laboratories, they broke windows, they left a complete disaster behind. Some officers also took up residence in the homes of officials who had fled or had been deported. Some, uh, as some memoirists noted, behaved well, while others left a trail of tears behind them. But then something odd happened. The Chernovitz newspapers started reporting that the Russian authorities began frantically cleaning the streets as locals were looking on, observing, and judging. They, as it turned out, had long-term designs on the region. Their intention was not simply to punish the population and to exploit the province's resources, but to integrate it into the Russian Empire for the long term. For this to happen, they needed to project some form of legitimacy, no matter how tenuous. Appearing cultured and civilized, it turned out, was key to that process of establishing authority and claiming legitimacy in this newly conquered territory, especially in this place called Bukovina, whose population made no secret of their prejudice against the Russians, whom they described, many of them, as Asiatic barbarians. But the Russian authorities didn't manage to hold on to this territory for very long. Soon they were pushed back by the central powers. And during the following years, Bukovina witnessed the constant coming and going of troops as the front line shifted back and forth. With each return, authorities who reclaimed the province had to undo the effects of the previous adversary uh, occupation authorities and administrations. Now, I want to fast forward to a few years later. Austria was now gone. Its armies had disintegrated in the fall of 1918. And Bukovina's last Austrian governor by December 1918 was put on a train to Vienna and shipped back home, while representatives of the province's most numerous groups, Ukrainians and Romanians, began disputing each other's claims to the province. The Romanian National Council uh, began invoking the danger of Bolshevik unrest sp spreading into, Buk into Bukovina, where Ukrainian troops had already seized several government buildings. And so they called upon the Romanian government to send troops into Bukovina to help restore order. Once these Romanian divisions were already in town, the council assembled a general congress in which they, and along with some representatives of Polish and German populations in the province, voted for Bukovina to be unconditionally incorporated into Romania. And this moment marked the beginning of over two decades of Romanian rule, as Romania's claims to Bukovina were recognized internationally by 1920 at the uh, Paris Peace Conference. After they denounced Austrian rule as completely artificial and illegitimate, the Romanian authorities began dismantling monuments that reminded the local population of the previous regime. Then they took some steps to leave their own imprint on the landscape to make Bukovina look and feel Romanian, part of this young, vibrant nation state rather than a visible relic of an old empire. One of the things that they did was that they replaced a monument to Austria that was positioned in one of Chernovitz's central squares 
with a new statue which celebrated the province's unification with Romania by highlighting the province's historic links with Romania and Moldova. Through the figure of this ox, which is actually an ancient symbol of Moldavian culture, that in this particular sculpture was shown trampling under its foot the Austrian eagle. The monument was supposed to celebrate the triumph of the nation state over the defunct empire. But that was not how most locals viewed it. Among them, the monument actually caused a good deal of hilarity. It became an object of derision and mockery. Before long, a group of local youths, for example, tied a bag of hay around the ox's head. This was a comment on the Romanian nation state's inability to feed its own people and also an indirect complaint about uh, declining conditions of living and um, poor economic situation after the unification with Romanian nation state. Another thing that they would say that became common at the time, a lot of memoirs write about, it was Romania Mare Mamaligonare, which means Greater Romania has no polenta. Nicely enough, it rhymes, right? And it alludes exactly to these poor economic conditions. So now I want to step back from here and suggest that uh, or rather, what I want to suggest by departing from these two episodes is that states that laid claim to Bukovina and thought of themselves as radically different and opposed to each other were often profoundly shaped by each other. The borderland province that they took turns in ruling facilitated mutual influence between them. Some of them were directly locked in combat, like the Austrian and Russian empires. Others were indirect adversaries, such as the Austrian Empire and then later the newly enlarged Romanian state that was built on the wreckage of this collapsed imperial order. Either way, what different states did in Bukovina and how they related to one another and to the population they governed was profoundly shaped by their proximity to each other, whether in space or in time. The first case that I spoke about uh, illustrates how physical proximity led to imitation and competition. The Russian authorities, having heard that uh, one of the main ways in which the Austrian authorities were justifying their presence in Bukovina was through claims of culture, had proceeded to clean the streets to demonstrate that they too were civilized. Bukovina was this, uh, or had long been a place of contact and mutual observation between the Austrian and Russian empires, and this feature of Bukovinian life became even more pronounced during this World War I episode. The second case shows how regimes in Bukovina, regimes like the National Administration that came in after 1918, even though they like to think of themselves often as having broken completely with the past, had to deal inevitably with each other's legacies. This too became a vehicle for mutual influence. They often ended up building on changes that were inherited from previous regimes and enacting transformations with materials that were recycled. They also inherited a population that brought its experiences under previous regimes with them, that made comparisons between successive regimes and therefore shaped with their expectations what the new government authorities in the province did and how they related to local society. Encounters at the level of villages and cities in Bukovina and individual communities within Bukovina had also international reverberations. They shaped how empires and states that came to face, face to face their thought of themselves in relation to each other and how they interact not only on a regional but also on a continental level. Which explains why Bukovina, whose remoteness and backwardness often made it into an object of mockery, found itself repeatedly at the epicenter of transformations which would come to define all of Europe in the modern age. So what I try to do in this book is tell the story of this little province as a place of mutual observation, competition, emulation, and conflict between different states and governments mediated by a local population that changed hands so frequently that it experienced repeated regime changes and changes in sovereignty, which often happened overnight. The book presents Bukovina and in general the East European borderlands as a place of unexpected entanglements, which help us better understand the evolution of modern states and sovereignties over the course of the past two centuries. The mutual influence of different regimes that set foot here uh, 
is best illustrated, I think, by their recurring preoccupation with culture as an instrument for total transformation. This is an ambition that they all shared. Successive regimes that otherwise completely rejected each other's ideological premises converged on this assumption that culture, usually measured in terms of urbanization and literacy, guaranteed modernity and prosperity. The promise to deliver culture to a backward, uncivilized place became a common source of legitimacy for successive regimes that otherwise imagined themselves to be radical opposites of each other. Okay, so now a little bit about the place, just to position ourselves. Before the 18th century, here the map doesn't actually show you, or this is where Bukovina would be. Before the 18th century, when it was annexed by Austria, Bukovina was located at the northernmost tip of the Principality of Moldavia, which is not in the map, but it would be here. This was a state wedged between the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire, uh, that was at the time under Ottoman suzerainty. Uh, the Ottoman Empire was defeated in a war with Russia, one of many wars, in uh, between 1768 and 1774, a war in which Austria agreed to serve as a mediator. Um, and this was what allowed Austria to incorporate at the end of the war Bukovina in exchange for its services of mediation. In the centuries leading up to this Austrian annexation, Bukovina had been a war-torn um, territory. It was constantly raided by one set of troops or another, uh, being part of this volatile region on the edge of multiple empires. Largely as a result of these conditions, these unstable conditions, the area remained quite underdeveloped economically and also underpopulated. So at the time of its incorporation into Austria, it was about, or a little bit over 10,000 square kilometers and counted about 70,000 residents at the most. The vast majority of them were Moldavian, as some of the um, sources from back then described them, meaning Romanian speakers and some Ukrainian speakers. At first, Bukovina was placed under military administration. And then in 1786, it was incorporated into the larger province of Galicia, uh, which had formed, basically had been a piece of the former uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth that Austria annexed as part of the partitions. The province briefly obtained autonomy in 1848, then it was reincorporated into Galicia, and then again in 1860, it became autonomous again, and this time for good. It remained under Austrian rule until 1918, uh, when it, you know, over the previous decades, uh, a couple of decades or so, it also witnessed the rise of national movements, and it underwent uh, an important modernization process and urbanization process. Both as a result of uh, imperial policies and efforts such as uh, you're right, imperial efforts to populate the province with new elements, but also as a result of regime changes, Bukovina came to have a really diverse population. The two largest groups uh, recorded in the Austrian census of 1910, which uh, recorded uh, people, the population according to language spoken rather than ethnicity, were Romanian speakers and Ruthenian or Ukrainian speakers. But the ethnic breakdown really began to shift especially since ethnicity was for a very long time mutable here. What these statistics don't show, because they only recorded language spoken, um, is that the capital of Bukovina, Chernovitz, was composed of over 33% Jewish population, most of whom declared German uh, as their main language. They're forced to do so because Yiddish was not recognized. Uh, here is an image also from... Uh, Chernovitz, which came to have about 26 different synagogues, so that are uh, kind of give testimony to the importance of the Jewish population. Um, these 150 years or so under Austrian rule were the longest period of relative stability in the region. Uh, but this changed in 1914 when, as I mentioned in August, well before the war was anything more than a sort of distant reality for residents of the empire further west, Bukovinans found themselves in the front seats of this new conflagration for which very few of them were prepared. The province came within an inch of being partitioned actually between Romania and Ukraine, uh, 
but in the end, the international conjuncture and the situation on the ground favored Romanian claims, and so all of it was incorporated into the Romanian nation state. During the next couple of decades, the province was subjected to intense nationalization campaigns. The ultimate goal was to incorporate it and tie it firmly to the structure uh, structures of the Romanian nation state. Even though the Romanian authorities discovered this was much easier said than done because the legacies of imperial rule proved so lasting. They couldn't be simply peeled back the way nationalists in those heady days of unification had thought they would. Out of the Romanian administration's frustrations uh, and the frustrations of the up-and-coming Romanian middle class who felt that the rewards of unification and nationalization were not coming soon enough, grew the, essentially the interwar turn towards uh, illiberalism and fascism, both in Bukovina and in Romania in general. Then, in 1940, as a result of the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact, Bukovina ended up being partitioned. The northern half came under Soviet occupation and was incorporated briefly into Soviet Ukraine. This was an act of annexation that the Soviets justified in terms of restoring the integrity of the Ukrainian nation state by attaching to it the last missing piece of Ukraine. This moment set into motion extraordinary population shifts that led to the definitive transformation of the province's ethnic and dem uh, demographic structure. The Romanians, who returned with German help in 1941 and reclaimed the north of the province, built, ironically, on the changes the Soviets had uh, launched and added to them by launching yet another wave of deportations, this time of Jewish populations. By 1944, when the Soviets returned and reclaimed northern Bukovina, the territory had undergone such deep transformations it could hardly be recognized. This time, the northern part would remain a part of Soviet Ukraine until 1991, when the Soviet Union unraveled. What I try to do in my book is tell this complicated story through the lives of state officials, urban elites, village people who lived in this seemingly peripheral place that actually turns out to be situated at the epicenter of some of the largest changes that were happening on the continent. And what I try to reveal is how profoundly these individuals engaged with, meaning contested, challenged, or sometimes embraced ideas handed down from the centers of power, and how they facilitated, often unwittingly, mutual influences between regimes. What I want to reveal or to highlight is how uh, regimes that often claim to be radically breaking with the past and be polar opposites of each other ended up often building on each other's legacies in the province. And here, before I go into uh, more specifics or the meat of the argument, I wanted to share a few pictures to give you a sense of what my research journey was. Obviously, I did this research a while ago. This was 2014, 2015, when most of the research that I did or the most valuable part actually could be found in the provincial archives in Ukraine, which was quite a journey for me. Uh, I took this old Soviet train from Romania. That you can see I was not used to that. The interesting thing is because in Ukraine, um, the old railways are still different, right? This, the Soviet had used different railways. The train was suspended in the air for about four hours, uh, leaving everybody kind of confused until we crossed over to the other side, where the provincial archives, which had been housed inside a monastery, actually a Catholic monastery, a typical thing that the Soviets used to do, now were relocated in an old pharmaceutical warehouse in this per total periphery of the periphery, essentially, of the city. So it was quite an adventure, actually, getting there and getting my hands on a lot of these documents. And the reason why I choose to uh, kind of tell this story is that in many ways it also illustrates or highlights the importance of these regime changes to the story because a lot of these documents, I mean, actually getting there is so much harder than it would have been really traveling there before 1918 at this point because of all the different borders and uh, bureaucracy involved. Not to mention that a lot of the documents pertaining to the region have become scattered, you know, with different administrations coming and going and then taking them away. You can now find pieces of this history spread throughout Romania, Israel, Germany, Ukraine, America, even the United States. So in what follows, I want to look clo more closely at the ways in which culture 
both as a means of, legi of claiming legitimacy and as a recipe for governance functioned in Bukovina, and how it became a recurring motif uh, and a point, in, a point of convergence between different regimes. Um, and I'll begin with the first episode, namely the uh, Habsburg period. Um, the Austrians, who governed Bukovina for a while under military administration and then, as I mentioned, incorporated into the province of Galicia, claimed, essentially, or were the first who began uh, invoking this idea of culture or culture to justify their rule. Um, this was a common motif both during the period of enlightened absolutist rule and during the liberal constitutionalist regime that Bukovina experienced and that was increasingly uh, under, uh, in retreat from the 1890s onwards. But it was really under the liberal administration that the idea developed that the Austrian Empire had a civilizing mission in the East, one which it would showcase and fulfill in places like Bukovina, this easternmost province. This cultural mission was especially important um, in this new juncture after 1870s when Austria lost its hegemonic role in Germany and needed to reorient and redefine itself. By the 1870s, though, a lot of liberals in Vienna had growing doubts about the viability of this cultural mission in the East. The political scene both in the capital and the western borderlands was increasingly dominated by nationalist conflict. But in Bukovina, low literacy levels also correlated with lower commitment to nationalist, to nationalist movements. So whereas elsewhere in the empire, the trend was generally towards greater fragmentation along ethnic or national lines, um, some examples are uni the university in Lemberg, for example, in neighboring Galicia, or the university in Prague had split into separate language sections. And there was a general pushback against uh, German as the main language of instruction in universities. Well, against this backdrop, in Bukovina, a group of notables submitted a petition to the emperor requesting permission to open a German language university in the provincial capital, Chernovitz. The mastermind behind this petition was a man named Konstantin Tomaschuk, who was half Ruthenian, half Romanian, and who insisted that, in here I'm quoting from him, Bukovina's non-German sons also strive for a German university because German education has universal significance. What he wanted, or what he was pleading for, was a university with German language instruction that would, in his words, be a spiritual lighthouse in the midst of these multilingual people, giving them all the same light. Notables like Tomaschuk were very eager to reinforce and consolidate Bukovina's provincial autonomy, and this was part of what he was doing here. This was an objective that Bukovina and elites had been pursuing for a while. But what was interesting about this moment is that they cast these demands in the liberal language of culture, demanding greater involvement on the part of the imperial state in the province and more resources to be devoted to the, as he put it, consolidation of Austrian state unity. Liberals in Bukovina continued claiming that culture, or culture as they called it, was not only the key to prosperity, to developing the province and bridging the seemingly unsurpassable distance uh, from Bukovina to the center, but it was also the key to integrating it into the larger structures of empire and turning its extraordinary uh, ethnic and religious diversity into an asset, into a source of strength rather than liability. It also seems that culture became a favorite tool of transformation in Austrian Bukovina because resources for other kinds of change were often lacking. Lofty cultural projects were always carried out by stitching together scraps, by recycling um, elements left behind by the previous administration because resources seldom stretched as far as this remote corner of the empire. So in this case, as it turned out, the authorities in Vienna accepted Bukovina's petition for a university in the German language, primarily not because it was a German language university, but because they estimated that this cultural project could be carried out on the cheap with minimal investment of resources on Vienna's part. At the last minute, Emperor Franz Josef, who had been invited to participate in the inauguration of the university, uh, backed out 
for budgetary reasons, as he put it. The inauguration was celebrated anyway with a lot of pomp and circumstance, but in reality, the university remained without a building of its own for a long time, with no storage space for books and equipment, which remained exposed to the elements. While students and professors struggled with a perpetual lack of running water and gaslight, many of them uh, read standing and used cardboards as desks. Now, the great problem with this heavy reliance on culture as a cure-all for Bukovina's afflictions was that while it did provide Bukovinans with some common ground with this shared uh, German language education or Bildung as they talked about it, it didn't really bridge differences between them completely. It gave rise to, or it helped to give rise to a new intelligentsia class who could speak this language of imperial culture, but who eventually turned this language against itself. These individuals formed the core or would form the core of nationalist movements in Bukovina, which developed more slowly and belatedly than elsewhere in the monarchy, but were increasingly difficult to ignore by the late 1890s. Nationalists, ironically, ended up reinforcing the idea that culture was the definitive marker of success and the favored instrument of transformation in Bukovina. They complained loudly and often about the imperial administration's injustices, and obviously also complained about each other, but in the process, they effectively reinforced this culture ideal by competing for, rather than rejecting, cultural assets as a marker of distinction. Interestingly enough, the Romanian national regime, which took over after the Habsburg administration disintegrated, while claiming again to break completely with Bukovina's imperial past, also ended up reinforcing this idea. Okay, here is the building that eventually came into being a uh, while after the university building. I want to share that this was, it was not an imaginary university for too long. So Romanian the Romanian administration and intellectuals such as the Romanian nationalist historian Nicolae Iorga, they completely rejected Austrian or dismissed Austria's pretensions of cultural and civilizational superiority. They believed that, as many nationalists did, that the empire was doomed to disintegrate because its culture, which was not national, was therefore uh, artificial and unsustainable without meaning or content. Uh, and as he memorably put it in a speech in August 1919 that he delivered in Chernobyl, uh, Austria cannot be regretted any more than Don Quixote's Rocinanta, this is the horse, who passed away sticking out his long tongue by the side of the road. But at the same time, Romanian officials couldn't help but notice that local, the local population viewed and judge them based on their ability to conform to patterns of behavior that had been established under Austrian rule. Whether or not their authority was seen as legitimate depended on whether or not they could deliver on promises and measure up to expectations that locals have developed under Austrian rule. One of the accusations that locals repeatedly leveled on the new Romanian authorities was that they were backward, uncultured, or culturally inferior to them. Uh, locals commented, for example, on the tattered clothing that Romanian soldiers who entered the province wore. Denunciations flowed into the police authorities about neighbors who said that, quote, Romanians are thieves and back in the days of Franz Josef, everything was better. Locals, uh, some officials reported, also believed themselves to be still in former Austria, in which time everything Romanian was mocked, and these thousands of people even today are propagating their anti-Romanian ideas and mocking any good Romanian institutions through insults and death threats. So both because of these expectations, and for other reasons, including an acute lack of resources, the Romanian regime also ended up upholding culture, again, as a measure of worth and success, and privileging cultural policy as a means of overcoming the rift between the newly incorporated province and the rest of the nation state. While singing the praises of the village, which Romanian nationalists envisioned as a kind of repository of national feeling, a place that was more nationally authentic than the cities, which were dominated by foreigners, as they called them, the new authorities set their sights on symbols of cultural power built under imperial rule. Uh, one of these was the city theater, uh, named after Friedrich Schiller, 
where German language plays continue to be performed well into the 1930s, much to the annoyance of Romanian nationalists. Or the university, uh, once named Francisco Josefina after its uh, patron emperor Franz Josef, and now rebaptized King Ferdinand after the new Romanian monarch. While the countryside remained underfunded and largely ignored by the state, the city Chernovitz, now renamed Chernovitz, and its cultural institutions became both an object of desire and a symbol of the new regime's impotence to do away with the legacies of Bukovina's imperial past. In November 1932, quite late, a group of radical nationalist Romanian students broke into the city theater to interrupt a performance staged by a Jewish director. Funnily enough, it was a performance of Schiller's The Robbers. Uh, as one police report noted, the whole time they occupied the theater, the students made a scandal, rang some bells they pulled out of the theater's coat rack, shouting that the bells were being rung for the eternal remembrance of the director. They broke a hydrant trying to hose down the police force, broke into the buffet with chocolate and candy, this is my favorite part, dividing the chocolate amongst themselves. Now, ever since the early 1920s, the Romanian administration had also been taking measures to reverse the trend whereby non-Romanian students, especially Jewish ones, took up the majority of seats at the university and in the city's gymnasium. They did this through various language measures, among other things, and these were meant to make it more difficult for non-native Romanian speakers to go to school or to hold positions of influence in the province. In 1926, for example, two-thirds of the candidates to the baccalaureate exam in Chernobyl failed the exam. 80% of the Jewish candidates failed, which led to mass protests that culminated with the assassination of a Jewish student by a nationalist Romanian youth, who was subsequently pardoned, actually, for his deed. The Romanian administration was still struggling to incorporate this province into the nation state, when the Soviets, after this non-aggression treaty with Germany, gave the Romanian government an ultimatum in 1940. And then, well before the ultimatum said they would come into Bukovina, proceeded to march into the province and annexed its northern half. In 1944, after a three-year interlude in which the province was recovered by the Romanians, the north returned to the Soviets for good. And here you have a picture of Chernyutsi Oblast so that is now, I mean, the area is still divided. The northern part remains part of Ukraine and the southern part is now part of Romania. The Soviets, because their occupation took place against the backdrop of a world war, had at their disposal instruments of transformation that no previous regime in Bukovina could resort to. Most importantly, mass deportations uh, the, and arrests. Uh, equipped with these tools, the Soviet authorities promised to make Bukovina uh, prosperous and modern at the same time, to enfranchise its population and educate, to make culture accessible and democratic. They effectively promised to bring a new model of modernity and civilization to Bukovina that would avoid the pitfalls of previous modernization campaigns, all of which they claim had failed. A revolutionary regime that they were, the Soviets naturally liked to emphasize the complete rupture between themselves and the past. But here, they too couldn't help but absorb into their own system elements of previous regimes that they encountered in Bukovina. For one, they're faced with a population that had never experienced Soviet rule and whose understanding of politics and expectations of how, about how the state and society should relate had been shaped by their previous experiences under Romanian and Austrian rule. Even more, these were people also with strong prejudices against the Soviets, who did not forget or forgive when they saw officers stealing bottles of perfume and drinking them as vodka, as many uh, reported, or uh, seeing officers' wives donning nightgowns as evening attire. All of these were described by locals as acts of barbarism that confirmed right, that the Soviets uh, essentially did not belong to the civilized world and therefore helped them question their legitimacy. What we see here, consequently, is that even while trying very hard to differentiate themselves from previous regimes, the Soviets in Bukovina began increasingly playing this game of sovereignty according to rules that had been scripted long before they arrived. They too ended up speaking about a cultural front 
seeing themselves as bearers of culture to a benighted population that had been neglected and left uncivilized by the previous bourgeois capitalist administrations. Cultural revolution for them became a crucial instrument of governance, just as important as collectivization and industrialization were. Soviets kept a close eye on literacy levels and school attendance in Bukovina and boasted that since their arrival, quote, public interest in newspapers, journals, and books has grown beyond belief. Their avowed goal was to completely eliminate illiteracy as soon as possible, to liquidate it altogether by the end of 1940. Unlike their predecessors in Bukovina, the Soviets had the resources to launch a full-fledged cultural revolution. They brought in mountains of books and propaganda. All of this at a time when food and housing were scarce in Bukovina. They proceeded to build libraries in remote mountain districts. All of them stuffed, of course, with propaganda. It took the returning Romanian regime years to clear the province of Soviet material culture, which was seemingly everywhere. This Soviet claim to cult bring culturedness, or kulturness as they called it, was to be communicated in Ukrainian. This was the new official language, which, as Soviet officials insisted, had to be used for all official purposes by all state institutions. North Buko Northern Bukovina's Ukrainian population also became the target of the Soviet regime's main literacy campaign. They were envisioned as the province's most nationally and economically oppressed group. They were a kind of surrogate proletariat, in the name of which the Soviets could rule. Denouncing the Romanian regime before them for having completely eliminated Ukrainian language schools, the Soviet authorities began measuring their success and advertising it in terms of the number of Ukrainian language schools they opened, and in terms of the increase in literacy levels in the countryside. Then they made inst instruction in Ukrainian compulsory at the university in Chernivtsi, a policy that was ostensibly meant to make it easier for Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainians usually of rural origin to acquire a higher education, but that had the opposite effect in the short term, as it turned out that not many Ukrainians who wanted to attend the university could actually speak the literary Ukrainian that university professors who came from uh, Soviet Ukraine taught in. So Soviet officials found themselves in the strange position of having to teach Ukrainians in Bukovina Ukrainian. Ukrainian culture was as a result appropriated and redefined and made compatible with the Soviet project. And this was how it came to be that this poet, Olha Kobolyanska, once a Ukrainian nationalist who had been pushed underground during the Romanian administration, now became celebrated as a symbol of Ukrainian uh, liberation under Soviet rule. Kopolyanska was 77 years old at the time, and she found herself unexpectedly propelled to fame. Her photos were displayed on front pages of the new Ukrainian language newspaper Radyanska Bukovina that the Soviets set up soon after annexing Bukovina. The newspaper reported that, here I quote, she is happy she lived to see this historic moment, the Ukrainians' unification with their brothers of the same blood and that she was living the best and brightest times of her life. This honored daughter of the Ukrainian people, as they call her, became a symbol of so the Soviet regime in Bukovina, rather of its emancipatory promises, both because she was a woman that had been denied public education and had been prevented also from publishing in her native language. Above all, she became a symbol of kulturness, this, this ideal of culturedness, because, as the Soviet authorities emphasized over and over again, and here again I quote, she worked on herself using all the possibilities available in the city to improve her cultural level. In return for a few meager privileges, uh, such as a state-issued pension, Kopolyanska was now expected to endorse the Soviets during, North, uh, during the first Soviet elections in northern Bukovina in 1940. And so, by identifying clearly with this one ethnic group in Bukovina, the Soviets ironically achieved, even while denouncing Ukrainian nationalism, a greater degree of ethnic homogeneity or Ukrainization in Bukovina than Ukrainian nationalists ever had. So now I'd like to step, step back and offer just a few uh, ideas, some food for thought about uh, the significance of the whole story. The way I see this 
So this is a story ultimately about imperial legacies. How the dilemmas of empire and instruments of governance, habits of mind, which prevailed under imperial rule, never really went away from this region. Neither did the structures and the ideas that empire put into place. The appeal of culture was one of these elements, perhaps one of the heaviest and most enduring legacies of imperial rule in the region. The Austrian Empire's reliance on cultural policy in Bukovina, often as a substitute for economic measures, failed to achieve its intended effects in the short term. As I suggested, right, a lot of the cultural institutions and projects that they advocated fell short, remained incomplete and inadequate. But the institutional, cultural and intellectual groundwork or foundations that they laid proved enduring and cast a long shadow over subsequent regimes with reverberations that lasted well into the 20th century. It was this formative period of Austrian rule here that created an expectation that transformation by, whoops, by cultural means should be carried out by and through the state and also set into motion a pattern whereby culture was also invoked by local society to contest a state's legitimacy or authority over a territory or to invite more state resources into the province. So in this region, cultural projects, projects of transformation were often carried out in a makeshift way and incompletely. And what's interesting about that is that this resulted in a patchwork uh, type landscape, one that consisted of fragments of different universes and cultural projects that got jumbled together. Um, it often translated for people who lived there in a sense of being caught between different epochs or eras, between different times, something that I also noticed when I was traveling in the area where you can see some examples of buildings that have been painted over. It's so eerie to walk around with all this writing right from before always showing up. It's like inhabiting multiple periods at the same time. Romanian script coming out from under um, the paint or sometimes German language script from before 1918. For a lot of Bukovinans, this experience also translated into an avowed distaste for politics, which became a key marker of regional identity here. This drew heavily on their sense of inferiority mixed in with one of exceptionalism. This explains why I think the province tended to move always in the opposite direction of the rest of the state to which it belonged. Whether that meant rejecting methods of transformation preferred by the political establishment in favor of more radical solutions, or sometimes upholding ideologies that were no longer in fashion or were increasingly questioned in the metropole. Out of this dynamic, there emerged a sense that Bukovina's identity was one which resisted the perils of politics, which surpassed or transcended petty politics. Politics became for many Bukovinans a catchword for extent, excessive centralization, rule through force, disregard of regional particularities. In the interwar period, interestingly, this translated into a growing appeal of, of anti-establishment ideologies among the population, such as communism and fascism eventually in Bukovina, and a growing rejection of democracy that Bukovinans uh, looked upon increasingly as a great disappointment. At other times, fear of marginality led Bukovinans to champion ideas that had been abandoned by the center, to agitate for greater state involvement, for example rather than resist modernizing or state building efforts. Even though these appeals for greater state involvement often ended up having unintended consequences. More broadly, what I hope to illuminate through this story is the role of small, uh, role of small places, seemingly marginal and remote, in the making and transformation of political systems, both domestic and international. Bukovina is one of these places that experienced in a compressed and accelerated form transformations that also occurred elsewhere. And so what we see reflected in its story is an increase over time in state's belief in the possibility of bringing about total change and also a phenomenal increase in their capacity to bring about changes over a very short period of time. Before World War I, regimes were seemingly more ineffective, the pace of change slow,
But paradoxically, these slower, seemingly invisible changes that took place during that period became an overwhelming legacy that manifested itself above all in the cultural and ethnic complexity of the region, which all 20th century regimes had to work very hard to undo or to master. So in a sense, the entire story of the 20th century here was the story of post-imperial, avowedly post-imperial regimes trying to disentangle what that 19th century empire had brought into being. What I also hope to show is that frontiers are not universally places where states come to die. There are also places where states and state institutions mean sometimes more than anywhere else, where the presence or absence of state authority can have life and death consequences, where the policies that state institutions adopt can make the difference between tolerance or relative harmony and total health. So in this sense, what I hope to show is how crucial peripheral territories were in fact to the evolution of modern state power, its ambitions, its ideological motivations, its methods and consequences. Um, and they continue to be crucial today. This is once again, uh, this space is once again at the very epicenter of larger processes of political transformation of an international, of an entire international system. Um, here is an image also of <laughs> these uh, kind of contrasting symbols that coexisted. This is again, I think 2014, or it might be a few years later when I visited again. In places like Bukovina, you still have these monuments to Soviet liberation, and you side by side with newly erected statue, statues celebrating Emperor Franz Josef. Unfortunately, Franz Josef kind of fell victim to a paint attack here at the time during an electoral dispute. Um, but the, the statue is still very much standing. Now it's essentially uh, one of the arguments that locals are making for uh, the region, for the reason why this region should belong to Europe. So again, here this region pushes us to redefine what we mean by Europe, where we envision its borders, and what we mean by democracy, and how willing, uh, how far we are willing to go to defend it. And here I will end. Thank you very much. Thank you.